so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. From Mamma Mia, I'm Mia Friedman, and you're listening to No Filter. In 2018, a woman wrote an opinion article for the New York Times called, I want to get rich, and I'm not sorry. Her name was Jessica Knoll, and depending on how you define rich, she already was. Three years before she wrote about how much money she wanted to make, Jessica's first novel, The Luckiest Girl Alive, had become an instant international bestseller. It was huge. Noel is no stranger to the headlines. Her 2015 debut novel, Luckiest Girl Alive. You, you guys read this? This was a huge hit. Uh, it became an instant bestseller all over the world. It's about a woman who's trying to reinvent herself after a gang rape and then the relentless bullying that followed. She was just 32 years old and she'd been working in magazines, Cosmopolitan, in fact, after experiencing something hugely traumatic and life-changing while she was at high school. The essay she wrote about wanting to be rich blew up because it is a pretty brave woman who speaks openly about wanting lots of cash. Women aren't meant to try hard for anything, unless, you know, it's to help others. Lasting after success or money or fame are all seen as, well, ambition of any kind is often sneered at when a woman has it, even by other women. Many of us, me included, have internalised the idea that a good woman should be selfless and she should never, ever strive for more than she's given, let alone openly speak about it. Well, stuff that. Jessica's reasons for being driven by money are fascinating to unpack because they weren't just about being able to buy a fancy house, although there's nothing wrong with that. There was a part of me, a huge part of me, that was like, I just have to be better than everyone around me. And if I'm better, then they'll see that like I'm someone who's respectable, I'm not the person that all my high school classmates said I was. Since writing that essay, Jessica has made even more money. The Luckiest Girl Alive was recently made into a movie for Netflix starring Mila Kunis. And now she alternates writing books with screenplays for big Hollywood production companies. So how rich is she now? And has all that money changed her? Here's Jessica Knoll. Here's something that you wrote that's really struck me. Ever since I was a little girl, my fairy tale ending involved a pantsuit, not a wedding dress. Success meant doing something well enough to secure independence. My something was my writing. Who did you learn that from, the idea that success was a pantsuit and financial success and career success, not a handsome prince on a horse? Yeah. I mean, probably my own mom. It feels so antiquated to call her a career woman. Like you're just like, what is this? The 1960s? Like, you know, (laughs) but honestly, growing up, I felt like a lot of the moms of my friends didn't have jobs, didn't have careers. And my mom really stood out to me and my dad too. Like there's a very strong work ethic in my family. And my mom just had beautiful clothes and like she would travel for work and you know we had a live-in all pair like I was like one of the only kids who had that because everyone's mom you know was able to do school pickup and all that and it never bothered me like I never felt like oh I miss my mom or I wish my mom was around for more like my parents were like around for a lot of things but I saw that and to me, like those were my goals, you know, not even goals. It was just like, that's what life is, you know, like you grow up, you get a job, you're independent, you're all those things. It was just kind of modeled for me, you know, like it wasn't like I had to strive for that. It was like, that was my day to day. That's what I saw. And then I was just really fortunate that when I showed kind of a propensity for writing that like, I just got a lot of encouragement, like from my family, from my teachers, from those around me. And so I just think those two things 
kind of came together and produced this sense of drive around writing in particular. Mm. And around success. Yeah. You've also written, I was 15 when I was sexually assaulted by three of my classmates at a party. It sharpens a person to be made to feel so worthless so young. With rigorous therapy, I've also recognized that it annotated my definition of success. I decided I could not consider myself successful unless I was somebody powerful, somebody nobody could hurt. Success became a means to wrest back control, literally to increase my value. There is a metonym for that, money. Tell me about that idea about success as a healing tool, as a correction. What did it become for you after you were assaulted? Yeah, so it's interesting to hear that because that's from my New York Times op-ed, which I think was published in 2018. So I'm almost like, wow, I feel like that was a period of my life where fully I embraced that mentality. And I feel like in four years, like Mm. there's more nuance to it now. And I've almost like grown past it in a personal sense, because I think that there was a part of me, a huge part of me that was like, I just have to be better than everyone around me. And if I'm better, then they'll see that like I'm someone who's respectable. I'm not the person that all my high school classmates said I was, you know, around the time of the assault. It was framed as something that like I participated in, that it was a party where things just got out of hand. And there was, was a lot of shame. You were slut shamed, you were bullied, shame, you were all of that. Yeah. And there was also like classes factors at play because you know, I wasn't poor, but I didn't come from kind of old money the way a lot of my classmates did. So there was a real sense of, I'm going to prove to you that I'm not the person that you said I was. So that carried me through a big part of life right after college, my 20s, even my early 30s. And with rigorous therapy, which has continued since 2018, you know, something that my therapist has been trying to get me to do is to find value in myself as a human being and that that is Mm. separate from success, personal, financial, career. And I was always like, I don't know, like you're only valuable. You're only worth something if like you're successful or you've done these things. Like I could not get my head around that. Like that's how little like real self I had, like sense of self. Mm. So I actually feel pretty proud that like I still feel like a very driven person and like success is still like a big part of like my dreams and like what I want for myself and what I want out of life. And like my career is like a huge priority, but I also feel like I – now have just a stronger sense of worth around just like my own humanity, which I never, never would have thought I would have said something Mm. like that. And I truly feel it now. Have you changed the way you feel about money? You wrote in that op-ed that rich is still a man's word and that you were unashamedly ambitious not just for critical acclaim, but to make money. And you wrote, if anyone says that's obnoxious, I want to do what men do and shrug. Yeah. That part of me will always be a part of me. And I don't think that there's anything to be ashamed of in being driven and wanting to Mm. have financial freedom and independence. And that's all still very much a part of me. It's weird because as you get older, you just feel like you have more responsibilities in life and homeownership, like, you know, thinking about starting a family, like all of these things are like four years makes a difference, you know, when you start considering things like that. So I might've been like a little bit more bombastic about financial success when I was a couple years younger. And now it feels like every time a door opens, the coolest thing I think about this industry is like, I've written a book and then I've adapted it. And it feels like every time I get to a next level, it's like there's another door that could potentially open. And that excites me so much. So yeah, I'm always striving. And I think that'll be a part of 
my life forever. Like I'll always be interested in challenging myself in making more money. <laughs> like I'm yeah. like, where's the Shonda Rhimes deal? Like that's what I'm after next. Yeah. You know, like these are things that I'm quietly seeding and thinking about. One of the worst things a woman can do is make money. You know, I co-own a media company with my husband that we built from scratch. And I remember a friend telling me that she got into a fight with some women in a social situation who were bitching about me. And they said, you know, Mia Friedman, she makes money out of feminism. And my friend was like, well, isn't that the point of feminism? Like, is it better that I don't know, Rupert Murdoch makes money out of feminism as if the worst thing you could do was to make money. And if you truly stood for something, you would have no money to show for it. Yeah. I do think that there is a sense and it's particularly around women that what you do or in my world, in the writing world, your art can't be taken seriously if there's also a part of you that wants commercial acclaim and success Mm. that you really can't have both. Like I do remember when that essay came out, I remember around that time, like I did a couple of other interviews about it. And I do remember that there was some chatter and it, it did hurt because it was from, and I won't name names, but like writers and women that I respect online about, you know, that's great and all, but like, I guess I just like actually like to write, you know, I'm not just in it to make money. You know, I think about it often because I'm like, God, the fact that you can't want both, like I can't love what I do. I can't, I haven't been a writer since I could hold a pen. And then I want this to be the thing that like, I, you know, can kind of create this dream life from my art, the fact that there's still criticism around that. And like this idea that you have to choose one or the other is sad to me, you know, and I've definitely faced that side of it. I wanted to ask you about starting your career in magazines because we both came up in magazines and they get a, a bit of a bad rap now or else they're not even understood as the force that they were and when there was no other women's media up until the internet, magazines were the launch pad for the careers of so many writers and women like you and I. What was your experience of of starting in magazines? So I started in magazines in 2008. I started as an assistant, editorial assistant at Cosmopolitan US and I truly credit it for everything good I have in my career now. I often compare it to when you hear actresses like Susan Sarandon talking about starting, you know, in soap operas and that like they learned everything and not only that they learned from that role, but that they continue to put into practice the things that they learned from those sets, you know, having to hit your marks, having to, you know, memorize your lines within, you know, a couple of hours of getting a new script, being quick on your feet, all of these things. I'm like, this is how I feel about the world of magazines. Not just that it allowed me to earn a paycheck and, you know, (laughs) here in the States, we need health insurance. (laughs) It allowed me to have health insurance and like all of these things and like live like a human being while at the same time being able to write and become a better writer. It put me in rooms with women who are also incredibly ambitious Mm -hmm. and also encouraged me to write a book because lots of, as you know, editors and magazine writers have, you know, separate publishing careers. And that was something that I saw with a lot of the top editors, with my own boss, with Kate White, our editor in chief. So they were all very encouraging of me. And Beyond that, in the development process of adapting Luckiest Girl Alive from a book to screenplay, there are so many notes documents. There are notes from the producers, from the director, from the actress, from the team at the streamer, the studio, whoever it is. And this happens over and over. You get a note doc, you clean it up. It takes you months, you turn it in and it's like rinse and repeat, like 
a hundred more times before this thing actually goes. And I never felt, I mean, I don't want to say never because there were definitely times where I got a notes document and I was like, I don't know that I can go back into this again. But I never took it as a sign that the product itself wasn't good or I never fought the notes because I was like, I know from my days in magazines that this is just a part of the process and that these are people that you trust. You know that they're good writers. They have good eyes. They know what makes a good story, whether that's in a magazine or on screen. And I'm going to listen to them and I'm going to trust them. And so magazines gave me that. And at the end of the process, you know, of seven years working on the script for Luckiest Girl Alive, I had one of the execs say to me, I really have not had an experience with a writer where they are so good natured about notes and in taking the notes and also not taking them like prescriptively, like you would get these notes and be like, okay, I see the ones here and I see your argument for it and I'm going to work on these, but I'm still going to do it in a way that it's like my voice. Mm. She was like, I don't know. It's just like a really special skill. Like you should know you have that. And I just thought like, that's from my days at Cosmopolitan. Like I know it is. Like I went through, like you really go through it. Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the magazine world. And like, I'll be grateful for that forever. <laughs> Coming up, Jessica explains why she had to fight like hell to write her own screenplay and why it took seven long years to get to our screens. She also talks about why she doesn't know who she is if she's not working. And we have a very frank discussion about kids and career. I think I may have said the wrong thing. Obviously, writing a book is a really solitary experience, yeah. sometimes unhealthily solitary, although mm-hmm. some people adore it. You fought like hell to be allowed to write the screenplay and you got the gig because you were cheap and tenacious and you say they didn't have a lot to lose because often new writers are brought in later in the project anyway, so you know they thought they'd give you a shot. You nailed it and yet it took – seven years and notes, how do you take something that you had all the control and then suddenly there's a committee giving you input as to we should move this scene, this character needs to be more this, change this. How do you metabolize that? And does it piss you off? I love that you call it a committee because it really does feel like a committee and you're like submitting it to each draft. You're like submitting it to the board and you're like, oh my God, like what's the word going to be? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I guess because it's a different medium, like you said, like writing a book is so solitary and like you do have your editor and, you know, you may have like other readers or like my literary agent works kind of very closely with me during the process of writing a book. Like I always turn in a new draft to her and to my editor at Simon & Schuster because like I value both of their input. Mm -hmm. So I think just the fact that when I started the adaptation process, I knew that I was a newbie in this new field. And I knew that film is collaborative and that there's lots of cooks in the kitchen, you know, and you meet other writers and like, you're all kind of bitching about the notes documents and all the different voices in the room. And sometimes it feels like there's too many. So on a certain level, you understand like this is normal. And what I actually think is great is because writing a book is so solitary that like sometimes I don't mind the committee because it's like kind of nice to like hop on a Zoom, even if there are eight other people on the call and talk things out. And like people are so passionate about why they think this needs to change, why this scene should come before this scene, like why this character needs to come out or this character needs to come back in. People are really passionate about it in a way that you're like, this is exciting, you know, and you don't feel like you're just working in a vacuum all the time. So that being said, after a certain amount of time, I'm like, I'm ready to go back to books. I'm ready to be kind of the decision maker, you know, at all points in this story. So I think it's actually a nice balance. Like both the mediums are like very nice buffers to one another. But Jess, they were your characters. It was your book. And it was not even just your characters. There were so many aspects of Arnie's story that were based on your life. She was in many ways an avatar for you, Mm -hmm. although I don't want to put words into your mouth. 
how did it feel when strangers are saying, no, I think that she would do this and I think that this character should be this? It's like, no, but they're my characters and this is me. I know. Yeah. I mean, so yes, it would be very hard and sometimes it would personally feel wounding because people would be talking about the character and it is fiction. It is a work of fiction, but like there is a lot of me in her and certain decisions Mm. that she's making in the film that kind of break off from the book are kind of Mm. based in like real life choices and things that have happened in my life since the book has come out. And so occasionally if someone would have a strong opinion about that, it can feel like, oh my God, they're judging me and they're judging the choice I made. So (laughs) I would work out a lot of that in therapy. Therapy? Um, (laughs) I hope that was part of the budget of the film. (laughs) God, I wish. Your therapy, it should have been. Yeah, I'm like, don't give me a per diem for meals. Like, I just want it for my therapist. Like, I'll take it. Therapy per diem, yeah. So the thing is, is I made this film with such amazing people who, like, I think by the nature of this character, the nature of this story, attracted a certain type of person who embraced this character and all her edges and all the pain and trauma in her life and how that had kind of warped her in a lot of ways. I think they were all on board for that ride, you know, and for her to be really real, even if that meant sometimes you didn't like her or like she made choices you didn't agree with. So part of the reason this took seven years to make is because she's a bit of a tricky character and there's like some really tough stuff in this book. But the flip side of that is that it attracted a filmmaking team that wasn't afraid of her. So anytime that anyone had an opinion about her, I was always open to listening to it because, you know, these people had always already proven themselves by just having such a tender spot for this character. What's the process of a a star as big as Mila Kunis coming on board? Like, is there a lot of back and forth? Does everything change when she comes on board? What impact does it have? Well, when she came on board, she read the script and she was like, I really like this. I think this is a really interesting story and a really dynamic character, but the ending isn't there. And we all were kind of in agreement of that. Like we had come to an ending that we all felt was good enough, but we were like, let's take it out to casting and we can kind of troubleshoot the third act at the same time that we're trying to find our lead actress. So at least we can try and get into production by the summer. That was the goal. So we knew that third act needed work anyway. And so it's really interesting whenever an actress signs on to the role, even the smaller roles, like her mom, her best friend, like all of these actresses and actors are looking and reading at the script with an eye to their character and their specific arc. So they're going to be able to pull out things for you that you might not see because we're looking at it from like a, you know, even me as the writer, it's like, I'm looking at this story holistically Mm -hmm. and like from a bird's eye point of view where they're getting really granular, you know, and they're catching certain things like, wait, I actually think that like, Maybe this isn't a satisfying character arc and this is my reasoning why and what do you think of that, you know? Or like, I'm a little confused. Don't you think this character would have known this by this point? And they they really do point things out where you're like, wow, I feel like I'm a broken record when I say film being collaborative, but it's like all these people come on board and they really do add so much value and just like make the end product shine so much more. Jess, where's your ego? Where's your ego? ego. It's like, so then the actress has come on board and you're like, oh, good. More people have joined the committee. Come. Anyone else? Would anyone else like to have an opinion no. on my script and my, my story? My ego. <laughs> trust me. I haven't. Well, okay. Here's where my ego went because I was super humbled once I stepped on set and realized mm. just how unlikely it is that this film got made. And not just this film, but any film, any show that you watch, it's so difficult to understand because there's so much content out there, but it is still a minor miracle when anything gets made. And I always knew that in theory, but when I got on set and I actually saw how much fucking money it costs 
and how much labor it takes and how many moving parts are involved and scheduling of like all these famous people. And then you throw a pandemic on top of it Mm -hmm. and like COVID restrictions and 25% more to the cost. You really do step back and you're like, this is not something I could have done on my own. And every single person who's a part of this is like, I'm grateful to them, you know, because like it takes so much for them to come together. And Mm -hmm. I don't know, it really just like humbled me. Whereas, I mean, going back to the idea of like a book, it feels much more solitary. It feels like Mm -hmm. if it does well, you're like, yeah, I did that. That's Mm -hmm. mine, baby. You know, it's a different thing with a film or anything that ends up on your screen. At least for me, it just like really changed my perspective on things. Something that you write about so viscerally in the book, and I know you've spoken about it a little bit before, is the loathing that Arnie has for her body and Mm -hmm. the way she diets, the way she starves herself, the way, you know, ostensibly in preparation for her wedding, Mm -hmm. which is going to be this cleansing triumph to her story. Is that something that you could relate to, your feelings about your own body? Yeah, definitely. I was full throes into an eating disorder when I was writing that book. And I remember my turning in like an early draft to my lit agent and she was like, there's so much food stuff in here. Like you've really got to, you know, just pare it down a little bit because when you're starving yourself and restricting everything and obsessed with working out twice a day and your weight and how your clothes fit and how you look and all these things, it's like all you can think about. It's obsessive thoughts on a loop. So I do think it was also cathartic to write about it, but it was on my mind at all times. And that's also something where like, I look back on, you know, when I read passages from the book and I read the things she says about herself, like she calls herself a piece of shit constantly. Yeah. And like, I really, like when I say I had like really no value of myself as a human being, like I really did not. It was like, I was only as good as my paycheck or, you know, my book being on the New York Times bestseller list or being married by a certain age. Like these were the things that gave me value and worth and it didn't come from like an inherent place. And yeah, it's taken like a lot of work to read that and look back and be like, whoa, that was a person who was like suffering. It's very common for women to take trauma and turn it back in on ourselves, isn't it? And punish your own body for what was done to your body Yeah, by other people. I also think it was like that era, you know, like I still think like even in the magazine world for everything that I love about it and I miss about it, like- God, we were body obsessed. It fucked us up. Oh, I know. I mean, we were all, we were, it was like the fucked up leading the fucked up, you know, like. It was. And and it it was was grunge and supermodels and waves. Yeah. Like, you know, you're, oh, you're not eating carbs this week. You're not eating sugar this week. Good for you sort of thing, you know. Um, Catwalk models. yeah. Yeah. It was all a part of it. I want to ask you about anger and revenge. What you thought was going to be your revenge how that's changed over Mm. time. It's interesting because you thought being rich was going to be your revenge. Yeah. And now you've found that that in itself is not enough, even though it really helps. It really helps. It doesn't hurt. I'll tell you that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I really subscribe to that adage, like living well is the best revenge. And I think that was like my North Star for the better part of my adult life until I got it. And then I was like, why do I still feel so crummy, you know? Mm -hmm. And why doesn't this feel good? And why hasn't this healed me? And I think that's when I really started to do the work of building up my actual sense of self. And a lot of that has to do with like And this is part of the movie too, where I don't know if this is like a spoiler if people haven't seen it yet, but you know, she says at the end, like, I don't know if I'm fun. Like, I don't know, you know, he says, he's like, we, her fiance, like we used to have so much fun together. I miss that. And she's like, I don't know if I'm fun. I don't know what parts I've invented to make people like me and what part is me. And 
that's like a real thing that I felt like I have no idea who I am. I don't know what feels good to me. I don't know how to spend my weekends if I'm not writing constantly and like, you know, grinding away at like the next project. Like, what do I like to do? I so get that. I don't know what I like to do. Like, I guess I just sit on the couch and watch TV, but that feels kind of gross after a while too. So like, my therapist would be like, hobbies. And I'm like, hobbies? No, no. But I think that we're actually super lucky that the thing that we love is also our work and the thing we get paid for. Agreed. Yes. Tell me about your husband. We just celebrated our 10-year wedding anniversary. The night of the New York City premiere of the movie was our 10-year oh, wow. wedding anniversary, which is crazy. It's a pretty hot date night. Yeah, not a bad date night. We got all dressed up, had some champagne, you know, like really could not have been a better anniversary. We met in New York when like my first year that I moved to New York and we've been together ever since. How has your success and I wouldn't say good fortune, but big fortune, well-deserved fortune, how's that impacted the dynamics in your relationship? Has it? When I worked at Cosmo, I did the bedside astrologer. That was my page. And so (laughs) the astrologer would like come into the office once a year and like do the charts of all the editors who worked on the page, which was really fun. And I'm not someone who's like super into all of that stuff. Like I know I'm a Sagittarius, but I'm like all the moons and suns and the rising and whatever. I'm like, I don't know. Like I just, I guess everything can mean something. Yeah, it's yeah. complicated. And and if it, if you love yeah. it and it works for you, good for you. It's just never been that thing that I've, you know, been able to, you know, get into. So the one thing that she did is she had, she did my chart and my husband's a Gemini. And she said, Sagittarius and Gemini, that's a pairing that will rule the world. They're both like very driven, very goal oriented, big dreams, big dreamers. And I think that that very nicely sums up our relationship. And like before my book even came out, like he was like, oh my God, what if it's like really successful and like we can do this and we can do that? Like he was so excited. You know, we've been married 10 years. We don't have kids. Like we're very focused on our careers. Like, and he's just like my biggest champion, you know? So I feel like I actually couldn't have ended up with a person who's better suited to that very driven side of me. That's the part of our relationship where like we speak the same language. Like there are other areas where like we definitely don't and like we have to work on it and like we fight and we work on communication and tone and like all those things you have to do in a marriage. But that area of like career and money and all of those things, like we speak the same language and that's pretty cool. You don't have to answer this if it's too personal, but are you on the same page with your husband and your thoughts about having kids in the future or it's something that's not for you? I am. And it's something that like we've talked about and we've worked on together because like I didn't know what the answer to that question was Mm. for a long time. And he was always someone who was just like, I'm game for whatever you want to do, which I'm told is the best way someone can be. If one partner is a little bit like ambivalent, it's good if the other partner is like supportive. But sometimes I almost wish that he was super like, I really want to have Mm -hmm. kids because it just felt like I was like, I don't know what to do, you know? And he Mm -hmm. was like, I'll leave it to you to figure out, you know? And then I had, that was like more work I had to do in therapy of like, okay, I don't know myself. I don't know if I want kids. The idea of kids terrify me because giving up my time and energy to anything but my writing and my career is like, I truly don't know how people do it. Lots of successful people and very driven people have kids. And I'm just like, they must really want it then because it's craziness. It's madness to try and do both. You know, I know a lot of friends who are like, I always wanted kids. I'm just surprised by how hard it is. And I'm like, see, I'm the type of person who's like, I need to hear like, is it good? Is it joyful at any points? You know what I mean? Oh my because God. I'm, I'm so just do it. Just go and get pregnant now. Go, I, like, <laughs> off, when we're finished, just when go. Finished. Just it's when a like cocktail hour here. So la- like just a few more minutes and just get him to put a baby in you. <laughs> like I highly recommend it. And I think that what you'll discover is 
this will be the thing that is fun and yeah. interesting to you. You I know, really beyond like work. hearing that because I think a lot of people yeah. just want to tell you how hard it is. And I'm like, I'm already organized to only see that part of it. And I'm, oh, no. I know it's hard and I'm scared about it being hard. Can you tell me the parts of it that you actually like? Yeah. All of them, you know, the, the, <gasps> And, and I think them. in many ways, wow, well, no, I've never heard that before. Not all of them, but I, a couple of things. It's great getting out of your head and not being yeah. the center of the universe all the time. Yeah. And I'm the same as you. I love my work so much and I, I don't like being pulled away from it. But I think as a creative person, it can make you better at what you do because it opens some doors in your heart and in your head and in your life experience that you you know, they're just rooms that are that you don't even know are there at the moment. I've definitely heard that. And I've just, you know, also heard it's just a it's love, you know, it's, it's a also love that, fun. It's fun. Jess, it's just it's yeah. fun. Like I know. The, it's hard work and it's meaningful. It's actually just funny. Yeah. And fun. And it, it doesn't have to completely subsume your identity. Yeah. And I don't think it's healthy for it to subsume your identity either. Like, I don't think that feels good for kids. I feel like that's a lot of pressure to put on a kid. And I know what it feels like to have a lot of pressure from your parents. So I'm like, you know, yeah. I just think that that sometimes at our age, sorry, you're a lot younger than me and I've already had my children, but I think a, a lot of times if you feel ambivalent, the ambivalence can just run the clock out. I know. And that's, and that becomes the decision. Yes. So that's what I kind of always thought would happen. I thought that I would reach a certain age in my thirties and I would be like, okay, I'm ready now. And then like that didn't, that didn't happen. So I was like, okay, I have to like actually just make a decision then. I know it's hard. I did it accidentally when I was 25. So I didn't have to make that decision, (laughs) but I just always assumed I'd have kids, but I wasn't like, I'm so clucky. I just want to have a baby. It's just fucking great. So just okay. good. We've got the we've got your evening <laughs> planned. <laughs> but before we go, you do have other things to do, like turn the favorite sister. Yes, that's right. Into a, another film or or t- TV, TV series. Yeah, TV show with Bruna again. Yeah. What stage is that at? We're kind of back to square one again, which is exciting because I had two episodes written. It had been optioned by Hulu a couple of years ago. They didn't pick it up and it's just kind of been stagnant since then. And I've been through this. This is not my first rodeo of like things not going somewhere. And then you kind of let it sit for a little bit, kind of turn your attention to other things. And then you kind of gather the committee again and you're like, okay, we're ready to like dive back in. And the exciting thing about this committee this time is that Mm -hmm. now Mila's a producer on this as well, Mila and Lisa Sturbikoff. So because we had such a wonderful experience working with them on Luckiest Mm -hmm. Girl Alive, we're like, do you guys want to be producers on my other thing? And they did. So Mm -hmm. it's great. So we had a committee meeting about that last week and, you know, we just had a fun breakfast and we're just kind of tossing ideas around. So That's one I'm excited about. And I'm excited about my third book, which we don't have an exact publication date, but it'll likely be September 2023. I just submitted that right before Luckiest Girl Alive came out. So that's another one that's like, you know, that'll probably be the next thing you see from me since, as we know, all the other things take (laughs) are like- Such a long time. And I imagine having an internationally number one Netflix movie under your belt I imagine that's not only good for book sales, but also just good for opportunities. I would think so. You know, that's my hope. We'll see when we take it back out, how people feel about it this time around. But I have a good feeling. Thank you so much to Jessica for taking time out of her incredibly hectic schedule to talk to me. I met Jessica actually when we were both seated next to each other at our mutual friend, producer Bruna Papandrea, who is the producer both of Luckiest Girl Alive and the producer of the show that I'm making with her company that's based on my memoir, Work Strife Balance. I was immediately so interested in her story and the story of Luckiest Girl Alive. I hadn't read the book at that stage, so after we had dinner at this party, I immediately downloaded it on my Kindle, inhaled it, loved it. Whether you've seen the Netflix movie or not, highly recommend you read the book. It's really, really great. 
And then she has another book called The Favourite Sister, which I also inhaled. The producer of No Filter is Emmeline Peterson. The executive producer is Eliza Ratliff with sound production by Madeline Juanu. I'm Mia Friedman and thank you for having me in your ears and thank you especially if you are a Mamma Mia subscriber for supporting women's media and everything we do here at Mamma Mia. If you'd love unlimited access to everything women are talking about right now, subscribe to Mamma Mia. An annual Mamma Mia subscription includes online access to every Mamma Mia event, our subscriber-exclusive stories, our subscriber-exclusive podcasts and videos from Australia's leading independent women's media brand. 